Today, we're going to slightly uh, shift, our, shift our focus to, to genome assembly, which is essentially aiming almost the same thing. So when we do read mapping, our goal is to figure out the, uh, the uh, order of the reads relative to each other, right? Because from sequencing machine, we don't know really the order of the, uh, of the, of the reads or their original location uh, cor um, compared to the, the, their genome. And our goal is to find that. And in genome assembly, the goal uh, is essentially similar, but there we don't really have a previously constructed uh, a reference genome, rather we want to uh, construct the reference genome or the genome itself by, by ourselves. So today, we're going to uh, talk about the steps, uh, the basic steps or the main steps that uh, people take in order to construct the assembly or let's say a reference genome uh, uh, from directly from reads. So uh, for today, the agenda for today is of course to cover the steps in genome assembly. So we're going to start talking about the basics and then I'll be talking about a, a common approach that is uh, taken for, uh, for genome assembly, which is called uh, overlap layout consensus. So before we start, uh, remember the caveats that we previously discussed. So we know that there are certain limitations of, of the sequencing technologies, right? For example, some sequencing technologies like Illumina uh, produce very short reads Right, and uh, some sequencing te technologies that are known as the third generation sequencing technologies produce uh, uh, a long reads. And our challenge is actually uh, to solve a puzzle, right? Either by looking at an already solved puzzle, which would be the reference genome, or you don't have like any uh, solved puzzle, but you just try to figure out by yourself, which would be the Genome assembly, genome assembly. And usually the question is, which sequencing technology is the best? Like which one should we use? And there are certain trade-offs between these uh, two types of uh, sequencing technologies. The first trade-off is essentially, as I also uh, just identified, uh, second uh, ge uh, generation sequencing technologies or, or Illumina specifically, produce very short reads, which are usually around 100 to 300 base pairs. So you, the read that these technologies produce are only around 100 or to 300 long. And the, which is actually bad, right? Because it makes your job harder to solve that puzzle. If, you, if your goal is to solve a puzzle, you would essentially pick larger pieces because your job would be much easier Right, you would, there wouldn't be any ambiguity. You would uh, quickly know which uh, where to place a certain piece, etc. So for that, uh, third generation sequencing technologies are more advantageous because they usually produce uh, very long reads. On average, 10,000 10, uh, to twenty thousand long reads, uh, but they can produce up to two million bases, which are known as ultra long reads produced by Oxford monopoly sequencing te technologies. So in that sense, third generation sequencing technologies are more advantageous, but uh, uh, usually a trend is uh, uh, second generation sequencing technologies uh, produce reads with very low error rates, which are around like 0.1%. And uh, third generation sequencing technologies are known as they uh, produce uh, reads with high error rate, which are around 10 to 15%. There are uh, recent approaches uh, that, uh, that, that is, for example, known as the CCS uh, uh, reads, which basically uh, try to find the consensus uh, between the circular reads, and then it will essentially produce you the more accurate long reads. So nowadays we start seeing also very long and, and accurate reads as we as we go into the future. So uh, you should also recall the dream uh, and our dream is looking forward, we'll be able to, able to read the entire genome sequence, right? Because none of these sequencing technologies uh, can, can read the entire chromosome or entire genome in one piece and, and, and such that they will produce the entire chromosome again in one piece and fully accurate. But rather we have the fragments, we have the pieces that we call reads. 
And our goal is to basically find the relative order of these reads to each other so that we can construct the genome itself. So uh, there are some basics in genome assembly. Uh, and as I identified, there is, there is no sequencing technology that can read the entire chromosome from start to end. Uh, rather, we produce reads, which are the short fragments of, of a chromosome or of a, of a genome. So um, uh, we reconstruct the actual genome from its pieces, from, from its reads, because of like we want to achieve certain uh, uh, goals related to biology and medicine, etc. For example, we want to compare uh, two genomes to reveal uh, some variations between them, uh, such as like structural variations and mutations, because we want to pinpoint diseases and certain phenotypes. So for example, uh, when you compare a, a genome with a certain disease with a healthy genome, let's say, you could perhaps identify the parts in the genome uh, that's causing the uh, that's causing the disease for that certain individual. And identifying those regions are very important so that we can focus on these regions to develop drugs to to um, perform gene editing as well, like in as 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 it's happening in recent years, etc. So it's really it's really important to to identify such regions. And we also want to map known genomes. We know, for example, in human genome, there are certain genes causing certain effects. And then we want to identify whether you have the, the certain genes so that we can, for example, tell you, ha you, are, uh, you have this certain probability to develop a certain type of cancer, let's say. So that, that helps us to, uh, let's say, prefetch the, the diseases that you may have in the future so that we can take action early so that we can improve the uh, lifespan and the quality of, of, of human life and, and actually in any life. And, um, uh, and if we can actually uh, generate an assembly that's very accurate, that's really contiguous, that's very complete, we can even use it as a reference genome so that we can start mapping the other reads from the same sample, from the, from the same species, uh, to that reference genome because we would know that like the genome uh, assembly that we just constructed is very high quality such that we can use it as a reference genome. There are usually two major approaches to, to reconstruct a genome, uh, which starts with sequencing, of course. In sequencing, uh, we know that there are two approaches. First, like uh, mainly two approaches. First is hierarchical sequencing which is used in the human, human genome project started in 1990s and completed in early 2000, uh, which cost $3 billion approximately to complete to generate a human reference genome. And we know that it's very slow and it's very expensive, but it's, it's really highly accurate and contiguous process to, uh, to generate the uh, uh, sequencing leads or the sequence of a genome. And another approach is called whole genome shotgun sequencing. Uh, and that type of sequencing is usually uh, is, is fast and is much cheaper, relatively cheaper compared to the hierarchical sequencing. Uh, but we know that it's, it's less accurate and less contiguous. It usually generates short reads with, with, uh, with a, uh, erroneous reads so with a relatively high error rate. So then let's focus on how to uh, uh, construct the genome assembly from whole genome shotgun sequencing. And we know that uh, our genome, let's say our like human genome itself is in a non-human readable form, right? We just take the DNA, take, take yourself and then out of it, we take the DNA, but it's, it's not in a human readable form. We cannot uh, easily do analysis on it. And our goal is to, is to do some process on it, uh, follow certain steps on the DNA such that we can convert it into a human readable form such that we construct the entire genome again, hopefully in full piece, completely accurate, representing your, fully representing your own genome uh, as itself, uh, so that we can analyze, do some analysis on it. And there are several steps to achieve that. First one, as I said, it starts with sequencing. Sequencing generates reads that are in a human readable form. So these are the fragments of the genome and we don't know the order 
of these reads, like we don't know where they belong to. In genome assembly, we don't map the reads to the reference genome because we assume that there is no such reference genome or we just want to construct the new uh, assembly, which is called de novo assembly. And to do that, uh, the next step actually finds the overlap uh, between all pairs of all, all pairs of reads, right? So we basically scan through the entire read, entire pairs of reads, and then we try to find the overlaps that like have matching blocks between them. For example, here the blue part is matching between this and this, and here the green part is matching between and this, so that we can find the relative order of the reads just to compare to each other, compare to every pair. And of course, uh, we don't know uh, uh, whether the sequencing technology sequenced the, the forward strand or the reverse strand of the DNA. So read may be coming from both strands. So we need to take care of the fact that uh, and maybe the reverse uh, uh, complement version of the, of the read will overlap. For that, we take the reverse complement as well and then try to find the overlaps uh, again between, between those reads. So once we find the overlaps, at least right now, we know which read overlap with which one. But still there's a issue uh, that like we don't know like the entire order, the global order of the reads relative to each other so that we can construct the assembly. And to do that, there are again several steps which uh, first does some cleaning. Um, is basically we have some redundant information in the overlaps. We want to clean that up so that the next steps are going to be relatively easier. And then next, we order the reads uh, based on the overlapping information after cleaning so that we can do some consensus approach so that we can construct the assembly again from this uh, ordered reads from this overlap reads. So this, is, this was the overview of the genome assembly. And I'll now start talking about like the, uh, each step in a, in a more uh, detailed manner. Uh, maybe I should stop and like ask whether, uh, whether there's a question uh, until now. Okay, I guess there is no question. Uh, I'll continue. Uh, so a common uh, assembly pipeline starts with reads and then uh, next it basically uh, um, performs the overlapping reads. As, as I also showed in the previous slide. So let's see how it happens. Uh, sequencing technologies produce reads, fragments of them. We don't know the relative order between them. And our goal is to solve the genome assembly puzzle by filling the gaps with overlapping reads, right? And uh, overlaps are essentially matching blocks between pairs of reads. And there are certain approaches that we can use to find these overlaps. For example, we could uh, just look at the exact matching very short subsequences between read pairs. We could uh, 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 use suffix trees or we could uh, use alignment, et cetera. There are many approaches to do that. And easiest usually is considered as uh, finding the exact matches between uh, short subsequence uh, reads because you can use a very efficient uh, data structures to find these uh, matching blocks very efficiently, very easily. Uh, there is a, a, a condition, very strict condition to identify or when identifying the overlaps, which is suffix of a read overlap, uh, suffix of a read overlaps prefix of another read. Meaning that if two reads are overlapping, one of them shouldn't be fully contained within another read because we want to actually extend our knowledge with overlapping reads, right? We want to extend uh, so, so that we can construct the genome assembly. But if a read uh, was fully contained within the another one, then our knowledge is actually not extended. We don't really create any uh, extra information. There is no entropy there. So we don't really care if a read is fully contained within another one. So that condition is, is there because of this. We want to extend our uh, knowledge. And these are some examples uh, of overlapping reads. For example, these two reads overlap at these locations, these, these regions that are shown. For example, there's, there's an overlap between this and this, between this and this, and this and this. 
So, all right, like we we find we can find the overlaps. We can find the overlaps between a pair of reads, right? And then uh, they seem to be independent from each other for now. So the question is, how can we really uh, construct uh, um, or how can we store all these overlapping information so that we can use them all, all together so that we can construct the genome assembly. Uh, for that, we use a data structure, uh, a graph data structure to store the overlaps. And we call that uh, uh, data structure as overlapping uh, graph or overlap graph, etc. So we use uh, graphs because they are useful first because of two reasons, first, to avoid storing redundant reads. It, it will help you to, when you have redundant or uh, same information, it will help you to store that information in the same place, let's say, so that you won't store it somewhere else again. And second, we want to identify the ordering of overlaps, of course, like globally, like entire ordering of, of overlaps within all pairs of reads, not just a single pair of reads. Uh, and now I'll basically quickly show the structure of the graph, how we construct the graph. Of course, since this is a graph, there are two main uh, structures. First one is nodes, and the second one is edges, right? And uh, we construct the nodes uh, for each read, let's say, or for each chunk of the read, if you are working with the chunks, like smaller pieces of the read. So we have a node for each read. And we also know that like these reads may be overlapping, right? For that, we use edges in order to store the fact that uh, two reads, if two reads are overlapping, then we create an edge between them uh, to store the information that there is, there is an overlap between these two reads. Uh, there is one more information that we store, which is the label uh, on the edges, which actually usually stores either the number of matching bases, for example, it, here it says, I guess there are 14 bases that match between these two and here 10 bases, or you could also essentially store the difference between them. It, it's, it's, it's essentially the same. So whatever the uh, process that you wanna do next, you can store uh, whatever the information that you want here. But uh, when we create an edge, we know that, okay, for example, here, these two reads uh, overlap with each other, such that there are, in this case, there are 10 bases, 10 characters uh, exactly matching between this read and this read, right? So we go on, basically, we, we do this for all pairs of reads, right? We see, for example, when we have, uh, actually, as in this example, uh, when we have the same read here, for example, this is the same read, but it overlaps with the another one, we didn't create a separate node, right? We use the one that already exists. And we just created one more node for this one because it didn't exist in our graph previously. And this actually helps us uh, uh, avoid storing redundant reads by just constructing a node uh, uh, unique, to, unique to each sequence or each, each read. And then we basically uh, uh, generate all these nodes, generate all these edges for all pairs of reads. And essentially uh, what we get is an, a full overlap graph uh, that represents all uh, uh, that represents the, the overlaps that we find between all pairs of reads. Uh, but there is an issue there, as it always happens. Uh, if you just like leave this graph as is, we know that the edges can quite get can, can get quite messy because you will usually have like millions of reads and maybe in the same order of connections between these reads. So you have like connections everywhere, uh, many, many nodes, et cetera. So it's really hard. To, it will be really hard to get some information out of such a graph. Maybe it's even MP hard, right? So our goal is actually, is going to be to, um, to reduce that complexity, to, to do some cleaning up. But in order to convince you that the graph can really get quite messy, let's just, assume, let's just construct uh, um, the following string that we know, like this is, assume that this is our entire genome, which is to everything, turn, 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 there's a season. So I assume that this is the genome and, and assume that the pieces that the sequencing technology produce are 
the are the every substring of this genome of length seven, which we refer to as seven mers, uh, if you want to talk about the K mers uh, uh, jargon, let's say. Um, so I assume that we have this every substring of this entire string, and then we want to construct this thing from the from the substrings. And if you wanted to create the graph, as I explained in the previous slide. It just only like a part of the graph, not the full picture of it. Only a part of the graph would look like this. So if you look at this, it's, it's, it, it's clear that there should be some cycles over there. There should be some ambiguities. So it's not really clear where should we start, where should we go so that we can fully construct the, this sentence from this graph. It's, it's not really easy. So our goal is to find an assembly by ordering overlaps correctly, that's, that's very important. We want to start from the correct region. We want to find the ordering of overlaps also correctly. Another thing, we want to make it as simple as possible. So how to find a simple ordering of overlaps relative to each other from the overlap graph, from, from this graph, essentially. So here uh, comes the uh, layout step to, to achieve uh, this goal. So I'll now quickly talk about the layout step. Uh, layout step can be considered as the uh, as the graph cleaning step as well. We want to make the graph as simple as possible. Um, we do this because overlap graphs may contain redundant information, and we want to get rid of them. So, what are these redundant informations, right? What what, what are these uh, type of uh, types of the redundant information? First one is referred as uh, transitive or redundant edges. So these edges are uh, usually uh, there are two different paths, uh, but you could essentially uh, take one of these paths uh, and ignore the other, other one completely, and you wouldn't lose any connectivity information. So this is like more formal uh, way of defining it. So you can assume that you have a node uh, V, and then you want to go from node B to W, Right, and then we say that uh, the uh, V to W is transitive if basically we know that there exists some path from V to U and U to W, uh, such that we can remove this uh, uh, V to W information without losing the ability to visit again, like starting from uh, V to visit W. So the goal is the, the the takeaway here is that we can remove some edges, but we can still start from U, uh, V. And starting from V, we can still reach W. Here, we don't care about the distance. We don't care about the number of matching bases here, but we just only care about the connectivity information. So we, we lose connectivity. And if the answer is no, then we say that one of these paths are transitive. So uh, another term is uh, bubbles, which is uh, slightly similar to transitive edges, um, but there are slight differences. So bubbles are directed a cyclic graph where like the sink and source uh, nodes assume that these are V and W uh, such that uh, there exists at least two isolated, completely isolated paths from a V to W. And if there are such two isolated paths, uh, the, the assumption is that we can collapse one of these bubbles so that we can uh, simplify the overlap graph. So here, th there is a chance that you may lose the connectivity information, but still after, if you are doing this step, after you do uh, transitive edges, then you, you should be safe to, uh, to do the uh, bubble uh, collapsing or, or bubble removing step as well, because we did the transitive edges earlier. Um, and there, there, there is one more uh, step in layout cleaning, um, graph cleaning, which is uh, are removing the tips. So in graph, we know that some branches uh, in the graph may terminate very early without giving us any information, without taking us to the end of the end of the genome assembly. So we refer to these such such connections or such structures as tips, and they can just be removed because they don't lead, uh, lead us to, to the end of the end of the genome assembly. So uh, let's go over like what the transitive reduction look like uh, looks like. 
Uh, as we said, the overlap graphs may contain redundant edges and our goal is to remove them. And the transitive edges can be removed uh, without losing the connective in information of the graph. So here in this example, assume uh, we know that the green edges are transitive edges because uh, blue edges here actually in this example provide the connectivity information that the green edges provide, right? Why, for example, here green edge tells me that I can start from this node and then go to this node. All right, I should keep that connectivity information. But are there like any paths that provide me the same connectivity? And the answer is yes. In this example, like the blue edges also provide the same connectivity. Why? Because I can start from this node, visit this node, and then visit this node. But essentially, I started from here and then ended here. So I, I'm still keeping the same connectivity information. In this case, uh, the green edge here is the transitive edge. So why not the blue one is not the transitive edge, but the green one? Because if we, so the, uh, um, uh, the step that we're going to take is basically is to remove this one because uh, we will know that the connective information will be will not be lost. But if we removed these blue edges rather than the green one, then we would essentially lose the connect connectivity from here to here, right? That may uh, uh, such cases happen uh, in the graph such that if you remove the other one, then you're losing some connectivity information in the graph. So that's why we were saying that the green one is the is the uh, transitive edge, and the other one is is not because it may be possible that we lose some connectivity. So here in this case, this transitive uh, uh, edge skips one node, and here in this case, there's another one here it skips two nodes. So although we visit more nodes, it's okay. Uh, our goal is just to simplify the graph right now. Uh, so, all right, then let's uh, provide more example. Uh, as we said, overlap graphs may contain redundant edges. And for example, let's just remove transitive edges that skip either one or two nodes, as in this example, right? This is this skips one node and this skips two nodes. So if you remember the messy overlap graph that I showed you earlier, if we applied the transitive reduction uh, on this graph, a simplified graph would look like this. So there is a quite difference uh, between this and this, right? A simple transitive reduction can help us to simplify the graph greatly, right? So it is now much easier to identify the ordering of overlaps from this graph. I guess you will all agree, but still there are some tasks to do if you want to simplify the graph even further. And the next one is actually the bubble collapsing or popping. So bubbles are, uh, we have different multiple paths with the same source and sink. And uh, these such bubbles may remain undetected after transitive edge removal. So there may still uh, such paths where we start from a source and end up in the sink state. And there are actually multiple paths doing the same thing. And then we call that bubble because as this image also shows, there seems to be a bubble over here. And our goal is to pop this bubble, right? So uh, idea is that one of the paths can be collapsed and usually the shorter one is collapsed because we know that shorter paths may be due to the repeats uh, after transitive reduction, there's this analysis on it. And then we tend to uh, collapse the shorter one such that we remove the bubbles as well in the graph. Uh, we can collapse bubbles to reduce the complexity of the overlap graph, of course, uh, improve the contiguity of the assembly uh, from the graph. So bubble collapsing helps a lot as well. Uh, so why do we have bubbles? Of course, there are multiple reasons for it. One reason is uh, uh, because of the sequencing errors that we may be missing some of the overlaps, um, overlaps between, uh, between reads and that may be causing creating a redundant connection between all the other nodes uh, that would have been, uh, uh, let's say, solved with additional more informative overlaps, or we may be having some variance between the parent genomes, uh, especially in the case of diploid and polyploid genomes. When you sequence, when you sequence a genome, if you are sequencing a diploid genome or polyploid genome, 
then you're actually sequencing the chromosome from both parents or both, let's say, um, um, multiple types of chromosomes. Uh, and th there are certain, of course, differences between parents and those differences may be also causing the uh, bubbles. And if you wanna uh, read more about uh, the layout steps, you can uh, uh, read the following paper to see how the transitive reduction works or to see how the bubble collapsing works in overlap graphs here. These are two uh, good papers to check if you are curious. Um, uh, so this is an example like how the graph would look like after uh, performing the bubble collapsing. So this is, the, uh, this is how it looks. This is how our earlier graph looks after we perform the transitive reduction. So if we um, identified the bubbles and collapse them, then our um, uh, graph would look like this. So we further uh, simplified, although we lost some information of the connectivity, now it's actually less complex or less erroneous for us to, to generate the assemblies because bubbles would make things a little bit uh, messy. So, all right, now um, next step is essentially we want to spell out the context. We want to spell out the pieces of the assembly from this overlap graph so that we can construct the, uh, the new assembly, the no assembly from overlap graph that we just constructed and then did some cleaning up uh, after all with the layout step. And uh, spelling out context is mainly starting from, 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 the, from the very early node and then just basically following uh, all the overlaps from each node to another one, each node to another one, so that like you spell out the strings that are that are written here based on the overlap information as well. And you do this again for all, let's say, um, uh, unconnected uh, graphs, right? Because these two uh, subgraphs do not connect anymore, so that you basically do the same thing for the next one. Here we don't start from this note or this note because there's a cycle here. We start from the unambiguous note where it, it doesn't contain any cycle in it so that we can just continue uh, uh, in a linear uh, fashion without getting into, getting in, into the, any cycle or any ambiguity. So once you, once you spell the contig out, what you get is, is essentially the context. Uh, once you spell the graph out, what you essentially get is the context, which are the smaller pieces of the assembly where, uh, where there are some gaps uh, between those contexts, such that we couldn't construct the genome assembly fully without any gap. Our ideal goal would be starting from here, ending here with no gaps, uh, which provides us the entire chromosome, let's say, with the, with the most accurate manner. Um, all right, so then how do we actually uh, uh, generate the context or spell out the uh, 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 string from the overlap graph, which we call it as the consensus, which is actually the output of the genome assembly step. What we do is that um, uh, we lay out the overlaps of reads from the overlap graph because we know the ordering of them. We know the edges, we know the connection between them. Right, and when, when you do the layout, it maybe looks like this, right? For example, this is the very early node. Uh, and then there's a connection between this and this, and then this and this. So once you do the layout, it will look like this. So the question is, how do we generate the assembly from these all these uh, connections? And a very sim simple answer is that, is to take the consensus. Um, uh, okay, I guess you can hear me now. I think you lost me for a second, so I'll continue. Uh, so next, uh, what we want to do is that we want to uh, generate the context from all this uh, uh, overlapping information. And very simple uh, step, very simple process to achieve that is to take the consensus uh, of, of these overlaps, right? What, what, what does the consensus uh, look like? It, it essentially, for every position of a context, for every, uh, corresponding positions as well in the Vs and the overlaps, we basically take a look at all the bases that each overlap is telling us. For example, in this case, these three reads are telling us there should be T here, and here this read is telling us there should be C here. 
So which one should should we believe? We should of course believe to the ones that are uh, that are more crowded, let's say. Uh, so we take the consensus and then we said, okay, since there are more reads telling me that there should be T here, then I'm gonna insert T over there. And here, for example, there are, let's see, three Cs, uh, um, four Cs and one G, then I should take C here. So in this case, for example, there are two A's, one C, one T, a little bit uh, ambiguous, but since I'm taking the consensus, then I'm gonna insert A here. But this is how consensus works. Once you do the consensus between all the uh, overlapping pairs, what you get is a single piece of content, which is a, a shorter piece or short piece of an assembly of the entire assembly of a genome, right? But it is much longer than the read. It contains uh, more information, overlapping of the reads, etc. So there are some optional additional steps that we take uh, after taking the consensus. We could actually stop over here. We could just say that, okay, our job is done. I just generated the context, which uh, refers to the pieces of the assembly and I can be fine with it. I can just use it for my further analysis because now I have a better information, better picture of how my genome looks like. But I may also do not stop here. I may do some several steps to improve the contiguity and also the accuracy of the context or of the assembly that I just generated. In order to do that, uh, we perform error correction and scaffolding steps uh, to improve the accuracy and, and contiguity um, of the assemblies. So uh, as you may remember, like we were generating the consensus, but we don't know whether the reads are fully accurate they may contain some sequencing errors, right? And those sequencing errors may then subsequently uh, propagate it to the assembly as well. For example, in this case, we didn't take any consensus, like there was only single uh, um, uh, example that we can take a look at. So we just said th there should be T here because like we, we, we only see a one evidence over there, but this may very well be a sequencing error, right? Maybe there, there's an A over there, and then there, the contact, the piece of the assembly should have been AA instead of AT. So, or for example, like here, there are two A's, C and T, maybe one of these are T, right? Rather than, rather than A or C. And in this case, we wouldn't put A here, but rather we would, for example, put T or C uh, uh, if we were uh, working on uh, full accurate reads. Uh, so, the takeaway here is that sequencing reads contain errors and then those errors may propagate to the assemblies. And then we want to generate an assembly as accurate as possible so that we, our analysis on this genome assembly is going to be also accurate, right? Because it's very sensitive analysis that we're doing over there. And the step to correct the errors in genome assemblies are usually referred as assembly polishing. Uh, what we do is that, um, uh, as actually we said, sequencing errors on reads may propagate the context uh, leading to inaccurate analysis. And what we do in assembly polishing is we align the reads that we used to construct the assembly that we used to find the overlaps between them. Once we construct the assembly, we can use it as a reference genome, right? Now we have something that we can take a look at as well. And what we do is that we align the reads back to context again to generate a stronger consensus, even stronger consensus now, because like we're doing some alignment operations, et cetera. And what we're generating is more, informat more informative than, than, uh, and, than generating the overlaps, because now we're looking at some picture that we just uh, created as if like we're aligning to a reference genome. And um, assume that these are some sequencing errors, like the white bars over there, and now we align the reads again to the to the erroneous contact a piece in the in the genome assembly, and uh, the goal of error correction is is to take a look at all these alignment information and then figure out how to uh, figure out the errors and then how to solve these errors. And assembly polishing errors apply certain uh, approaches. There are machine learning based approaches. There are consensus-based approaches, et cetera. But essentially the goal is to, of course, to solve these problems. 
And there's a, a, a recent tool that we published in our group that we call Apollo. So you can take a look at uh, how a machine learning based error correction uh, approach works for solving the errors in, in, in assemblies. Uh, another step to uh, further, uh, let's say, improve the contiguity of the assembly is to, is to, is called, is referred as scaffolding, which is uh, ordering the context. Once we, once we generate the context, these are usually not ordered. These are, uh, uh, these are basically the larger pieces, lo longer pieces, longer than the reads, but still probably shorter than the chromosome or the genome itself. And we don't know the order between them still. And what we want is uh, we want a gapless chromosome. Um, and we know that a gapless chromosome may potentially be represented by several gapped contexts, right? Because we don't know the order between them. Uh, the question is, what is the relative order of context to present the genome or the chromosome correctly? Uh, this is what scaffolding uh, is is answering or is 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 achieving the soul. Here, you can see that these are unordered contexts, and then we want to identify the order between them. Uh, and what we do is that uh, we overlap the parts of reads to contexts, right? to find the pairwise ordering of contexts. So in this case, here we have these two contexts, right? We don't know the order between them yet. They are on unordered, but we also have this read that we pick. And then what we do is that we perform an overlap of this read to this assembly, to this context, and also to this context. And then once, once we do the overlap, maybe we're going to get an information like this, right? Some part of it overlaps here and some part of it overlaps here. So now it's clear for us there should be a link between them. Okay, maybe I cannot still fill the gap, but at least now I can order the context so that I can maybe insert some uh, dummy string over here so that I can generate even longer, maybe ideally chromosome size uh, context uh, or assemblies. Uh, similarly, maybe uh, 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 a read uh, overlaps like this, etc. And um, uh, so what helps scaffolding? It's usually we want to use ultra long reads so that we can identify such overlaps. We can use paired and reads. Paired and reads usually uh, comes from, uh, uh, they are essentially paired where there's a gap between them and maybe one pair may be overlapping here and one pair overlapping here. But since we already know that th like these two pairs are close to each other, we can say that maybe these contexts are also close to each other. Uh, optical mapping is used. Uh, optical mapping is, is, a, is an accurate approach if you want to identify certain chimeras in, in, in genome. So for example, you identify the chimer here, 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 and here, and then you say that, okay, since these chimeras are uh, consecutively appearing here and here and here, maybe uh, these two uh, contexts are next to each other so that I can I can order them. But these are, I'm not gonna talk about them in detail. So these are good keywords for you to check if you are curious, if you are curious for learning uh, more uh, about scaffolding and further analysis. So last, uh, we talked about uh, how to find overlaps, how to generate a graph out of the overlaps, how to uh, clean that graph and how to spell out a sequence from this clean graph, right? But still, uh, we don't know whether, even after error correction, even after scaffolding, we don't know, uh, like we created the best possible uh, assembly that's the best representative of a certain individual. We don't know that. And any error in your analysis, any error in your assembly may cause, uh, I don't wanna basically be, uh, be uh, let's say, very negative about it or like uh, uh, dramatic about it may cause basically disasters uh, that you may uh, end up uh, suggesting a, a different a wrong drug to a certain individual and that may cause some serious health issues. And the goal is to make this analysis as accurate as possible. So what helps us to make a good assembly? First one is we want to have our reads uh, and the assembly as accurate as possible. 
So the assembly and the reads should be resolved from errors as much as possible. And there are certain solutions for that. For example, we can use long and accurate reads. Pet boy hyper reads are, are, are recent, uh, not so recent anymore, but we can say relatively recent compared to other sequencing technologies. Uh, there are recent approaches to achieve that. We can use error correction tools. We can use accurate assemblers uh, rather than maybe fast and quick ones. If your goal is to, of course, generate the most accurate one. Um, and the assembly should be as contiguous as possible. There should be less gaps, even like maybe no gaps. Uh, it should be filled with full information, should show you the, show the information of your entire genome. Because there are usually gaps and those gaps are missing information on the assembly, on your genome. We don't really want to miss out such information. And the solutions for that, again, using long and very accurate reads, again, accurate assemblers. And, but further, we need better tools to resolve repeats in overlapped graphs such that we can generate uh, contiguous uh, assemblies. Like when we pop the bubble, we won't have any gap Rather, we will have this full information in the graph without any gaps such that we can generate the assembly. Um, and there are certain tools. If you want to basically take a look at, if you want to use them, if you are curious, there are certain tools that you can use for each step. Uh, for example, if you, want to, if you want to generate the overlaps, you can use Minimap2 or Common. If you want to uh, generate the DNOVA assembly, you could use Miniasm, you could use MDGB, uh, and MDBG, sorry. You could use Kano, you could use Hypheism or Fly. These work with different types of data, different types of sequencing technologies, and they have different profiles in terms of uh, performance and their accuracy. Uh, and how are you going to assess the assembly that you just generated? Right? Because you want to make sure that that assembly you generated is, is as, as accurate as possible. And for that, there are certain assessment tools such as Quast or the Mumu package that will help you to provide some statistics so that you can have an idea on the assembly that you just generated, whether it is sufficiently contiguous, whether it is sufficiently accurate. So with that, I will uh, finish the uh, genome assembly uh, lecture. And I hope this was very uh, informative for you. And I hope you could also see some connections between the read mapping and genome assembly, at least in terms of the uh, high level picture uh, that what we want to generate at the end.